Amen. Thank you, JT and music team, for leading us in worship together this morning. Good morning. It's good to see everybody. It is now the month of August. It's the month of August, and so all of my uh, students and teachers, students and teachers, just, I'm not, I'm not going to ask you to embarrass yourself. Just give me a quick little, let me see where my students and teachers are. If you're a student of any form or a, or a teacher of any form, okay. Now keep your hand up if you are eager for school to start. Okay, there's actually quite a few hands that are still raised. Very good. I like that. Some teacher's pets and some, well, whatever the teacher's version of teacher's pet is, are in the room uh, here this morning. Good. It's good to see everybody. Uh, my name's Pastor Jeremy, and if you're visiting with us, it's a joy to have you with us here um, this morning. Glad, glad you've taken time this morning to come and gather with God's people and worship the Lord together with us this morning. Um, just by way of reminder, um, uh, next Sunday... Pastor Benny Anderson will be here with us and preaching uh, for me. I'll be away next Sunday, but Pastor Benny Anderson. Pastor Benny is an African-American pastor here in Amarillo, pastors a wonderful African-American church here in Amarillo, New Hope Baptist Church, and he and I have been friends for a number of years. He came and preached for me when I was in Dalhart, and uh, I'm thankful that he's going to be coming and opening God's Word. He is a faithful pastor, and he knows how to preach, and so you will enjoy. Take good care of him uh, while I'm away. I know that you will. I know that you'll love on him and be uh, gracious and kind to him while he's here. So he and his wife Paulette will be with us, um, and, and I'll be I'll watch that sermon at some point uh, before I get back, Lord willing. So uh, you'll enjoy having him. And then next month I'll be gone on a Sunday, one Sunday uh, in the month of September. And Pastor Matt Moore, who was a uh, fellow pastor, um, associate pastor with me in Dalhart, will be filling in for me the Sunday I'm gone in September. And you will thoroughly enjoy hearing uh, Matt Moore preach. He's an excellent preacher, handler of God's word, and uh, you'll enjoy hearing him preach. And then in the month of October, I I was able to find a fella, some of you may have heard of before, a pastor named Gil Lane. I don't know if you know Pastor Gil Lane. Okay, so familiar to a few of you. Pastor Gil, yeah, yeah, you can, he's not here, but you can clap um, for, (laughs) clap for me for inviting him. Um, uh, Pastor Gill is going to be here. I'm excited. I will be here on that Sunday, and he'll be uh, coming and spending a weekend with us. And uh, um, I, I have had opportunity to meet him a couple times and speak with him a few times. Uh, and uh, I'm looking forward to a, a more extended weekend with he and Mary will be joining him as well. So they'll be here October 22nd. Uh, I shouldn't have told you which exact Sunday. That way you would have just been here every Sunday in October waiting to see when Pastor Gill's going to be here. No, you, you, you're faithful and uh, eager every Sunday, so I'm, I'm thankful for that. Yep, so we've got some exciting uh, men who are going to be standing in this pulpit and opening God's word for us here over uh, the next few months, and I'm, I'm glad uh, that that will be the case. Take out your Bibles, please. And to the surprise of some of you, I actually am not quite done with the book of Hosea. I did not finish last week. Hosea, chapter 14, verse 9. Hosea 14, 9 will be our passage for consideration this morning. Hosea, chapter 14, very last book, or very last verse in this glorious book that we've spent a number of weeks looking at together. By the way, uh, Pastor Benny will be preaching next week. I'm not exactly sure what passage of Scripture he'll be preaching from, but then after that, we'll be starting the book of Ephesians together, and we'll be preaching through Ephesians. That should take us right up to the first part of December, so we'll be preaching through the book of Ephesians during the fall here this year. Let me just make you aware of a, a resource that's available um, there, uh, I think several different Bible versions have this. I know Crossway has one and the English Standard Version, which is the version I'll be using as I preach through the book of Ephesians. But they have these little scripture journals. And on one page, on the left-hand side is the scripture. And on the right-hand side is a, kind of a lined page for you to take notes on. And they're just a small, thin little journal. And it was, it's just the book. They have one for each book of the Bible, as I recall. And there are, they have these for the book of Ephesians. Some of you may really enjoy having something like that to kind of use in our study of Ephesians together. It's the kind of thing you can read during the week and mark where you have your questions, and then as we preach through the book together, you can make notes and write in the the outlines for the sermons and that sort of thing. You can take out your phones right now and go to Amazon.com. And um, it's just that's the easiest way for you to get it. Order it now, and it'll be at home before you get home this afternoon. 
Hosea chapter 14, verse 9. Hosea 14, verse 9 reads a little differently than the rest of the 14 chapters that we've already spent weeks working through. Hosea 14, verse 9 says this. Whoever is wise, let him understand these things. Whoever is discerning, let him know them. For the ways of the Lord, the ways of the Lord are right. And the upright walk in them. But transgressors stumble in them. Father, would you please help us? Spirit of God, would you come? We, we know that you're here, but we need, you to, we need you to do your work in us and for us. These black marks on a white page simply being viewed by our eyes or heard by our ears cannot, cannot alone change them. But we know that the Spirit of God using the Word of God can change us into the image of God in Christ. We pray these things in your name and for your glory. Amen. Tomorrow morning, my family is going to load up into two vehicles and take our oldest son to college. Many of you have traveled these waters before. You know what lies ahead for the McMorris family. We're going to take him, it takes two days to get to Greenville, South Carolina. Now, now imagine a couple of different scenarios playing out tomorrow morning. Imagine tomorrow morning early, the, the van is packed, Jay's car is packed with his, with his college stuff, and we get up early and I say, okay, we're ready, everybody's loaded in the vehicles, and I say, I have no idea where we're going or how to get there. Let's go. And I just take off driving. It's not gonna take, it's not gonna take long for me and everyone that I'm with to realize he doesn't know where he's going and he doesn't know how to get there, we're in big trouble. And, and you, if you knew that that was my game plan, you would say, Jeremy, you, you need to kind of rethink that plan. It's not a very good plan. Uh, you, lack, you lack wisdom, bud. You lack wisdom. What you're getting ready to do is really foolish. Or imagine another scenario, that, that we get up early in the morning, and the, the van is loaded, and the car is loaded, and I say, I know exactly where we're going, I know exactly where we need to go, and I know, I know how to get there, but instead, we're, we're going to go there by way of Portland, Oregon. And we're not going to use we're not going to use the van. We're not going to use the car. We're going to use roller skates, <laughs> right? Now this is ridiculous. I'm making this illustration ridiculous on purpose because again, you would say, okay, you, you know where to go. You, you you know you even know the right way. You even know the right how to get there, but but you're not choosing the right way. You you know the right way, but you're not choosing the right way. A helpful definition for the concept of wisdom found in the Bible is this. You can write this down. I'm not sure if this is on the screen for you or not. Wisdom is knowing and choosing the best path to the best place. Now, that's not a technical definition of wisdom, and I have to thank my father-in-law for giving me the basic idea. I improved it a little bit. His definition needed a little massaging, so I made it a little bit better. I'm just kidding. Well, I'm actually not kidding. I did change it, and I think it's better. Wisdom, <laughs> wisdom is knowing, right? So I, I know the best path to the best place. It's knowing and choosing the best path 
to the best place. There's four concepts in that simple description and all four of them are necessary. Knowing and choosing the best path to the best place. Now that's worth writing down, especially because I didn't come up with the definition all by myself. Wisdom is knowing and choosing the best path to the best place. And we're going to see that Hosea ends his sermon, if you will, to the people of Israel by saying this. Listen, Listen, wisdom is knowing and choosing the best path to the best place. Hosea, so Hosea ends the book of Hosea with one verse <coughs> that sounds different than the rest of the book sounds. He actually ends the book of Hosea with a proverb. And a proverb is just a, a simple saying that contains truth. This proverb he concludes with is not just a a random thought that he had at the end of the book that he thought, you know what, I'm not exactly sure how to land the plane uh, of this book, so I'm just going to throw something out there that's generally true. He's he's doing something wise. He's, He's telling us that for those who are wise, what they've just heard will affect the way they think and the way they live. So the main point this morning is this. The wise walk in the ways of the Lord. The wise walk in the ways of the Lord. And all three of those W words are in this little verse. The wise are described in this verse. Walking in the ways of the Lord is described in this verse. And the ways of the Lord are described in this verse. And so once again, my sermon title is not particularly clever. I just looked at the verse and what does the verse say? Oh, the verse says that the wise walk in the ways of the Lord. Whoever is wise, let him understand these things. Whoever is discerning, let him know them. For the ways of the Lord are right and the upright walk in them but transgressors stumble in them. So let's, let's, let's take this verse apart and understand from it what God wants us to understand this morning. First of all, let's, let's understand that it's important for us to know the ways of the Lord. Point number one this morning, we've got three points here. We're going to talk about knowing the ways of the Lord, then we're going to talk about walking in the ways of the Lord, and then thirdly, we're going to talk about trusting in the works of the Lord. Knowing the ways, walking in the ways, and trusting in the works. Point number one, knowing the ways of the Lord. Here in the, right in the middle of this little poetic um, a proverb is the phrase, the ways of the Lord are right. What are, what are the ways of the Lord? Now you could take this verse without understanding any of the rest of the book of Hosea. And if you've been a Christian for any amount of time, you could take this verse and read it, and just immediately there's a pretty surface level understanding of the verse that, that's obvious, and it's even appropriate. Right? We, we can read this and understand, okay, yeah, like a wise and a discerning person, they, they know the ways of the Lord, they understand the ways of the Lord, and they walk in the ways of the Lord. But before we start describing it all, let's make sure that we understand what the ways of the Lord are. Think about the, think about the phrase, the ways of the Lord. What exactly does that mean? How do we understand that? How can we, how can we describe that? And I think one of the ways that we can understand that is by even replacing the name Lord with, with someone else's name. Excuse me, I thought there was a bottle of water under here, and I'm, there's some of those little communion um, cups down there, but I don't think, I don't think those are going to be helpful at all. When we think about the ways of the Lord, let's just replace the name Lord with another name, and let's see if that helps us at all. The, The ways, the ways of Taylor Swift. Oh, thank you, Marty. Thank you, thank you. Thank you very much. <clears throat> the ways of Taylor Swift, the ways of Donald Trump, the ways of Dwayne Johnson, right? Like three very different people that we all know. 
But when I, describe, when I say the ways of and then I name someone, immediately some things start coming to your mind about the character of that person, the, the behavior of that person, the, the values of that person. And, and even without us describing any more specifics about the person, you begin to understand, oh yeah, the, the ways of Taylor Swift are different than the ways of Dwayne Johnson. They're different from the ways of your spouse, right? They're, the ways of people describe, describe the character, the values, the abilities of that person. And when we think about the ways of the Lord, often we start by thinking about the character of God, the attributes of God. We think about the fact that God is omniscient and omnipotent and omnipresent. We think about these, these truths about God, that God's ways are, the Bible says, above our ways, that they're beyond our ways. That's part of the ways of God. That's a, that's a helpful way to understand the ways of the Lord in this verse. Another way when we think about the ways of the Lord, we think about his commandments or his instructions to us. And maybe the Ten Commandments immediately come to mind and we know the, that thou shalt and the thou shalt nots of the Scripture. And that begins to help us understand more clearly the, the ways of the Lord. And, and that's true. Those, those are the ways of the Lord. And that's a helpful thing for us to remember as we consider the ways of the Lord. But remember, remember... That Hosea is not giving us this little proverbial nugget at the end of the book of Hosea in a vacuum. He's not just declaring this at the very end like, oh, and by the way, he's just spent 14 chapters giving revelation from the God of the universe to the nation of Israel about some very specific things. He's just finished up describing the ways of the Lord with this incredible object lesson that Hosea himself has lived out. Remember, and if you're just joining us this week or you're not familiar with the story of Hosea, Hosea was one of God's prophets. It's like an Old Testament pastor. He was one of God's men, and he asked, God asked Hosea to do something that would, that would illustrate for God's people their sin, a, a, a way that would help them see their sinfulness and a way that would help them see God's love for them. And God asked Hosea to marry a woman who was and would be unfaithful to Hosea. And Hosea did. He, he married a woman named Gomer. And Gomer was unfaithful to him on repeat. And Hosea continued to love and to take care for Hosea. And, and this story, the, the concluding part of the book of Hosea, or the story of Hosea and Gomer, Hosea goes and he buys her back out of this, out of this slave market and brings her back into relationship with him and putting on display his unconditional always and forever steadfast love for Gomer, which illustrates for the people of Israel the always and forever steadfast love of God for his people. And so with all of that in mind, with all of that in mind, Hosea says, whoever is wise, let him understand these things. Okay, with your eyes, looking in your Bibles at verse 9, see the words, these things, and make sure that you never forget that those things are referring to chapter 1, verse 1, through chapter 14, verse 8. That's the these things of verse 9. Whoever is wise will understand what God is doing in the book of Hosea. Whoever is discerning will know what God is proclaiming through the story of Hosea. For God's ways and God's work through the life of Hosea and Gomer are right. And the upright will walk in the truths that have been presented here in the book of Hosea, but transgressors will stumble over the truths that have been presented here in the book of Hosea. These things are referring to what we've just read, what we've just been talking about over the last couple of months. We see the ways of the Lord here in the gospel of Hosea. We remember our three-word outline, sin, judgment, and hope. We see the sinfulness of Gomer 
and the sinfulness of Israel and the sinfulness of ourselves. We, we also see the judgment that God will bring against Gomer and Israel and us, but we also see the hope because of the steadfast love of God that comes to Gomer and Israel and us. These are the ways of the Lord. And this verse, right in the center of verse 9, it says that the ways of the Lord are right. His ways are right. That, that Hebrew word can be translated right or straight or true, level, safe. The ways of God are straight and right and true and level and safe. His ways are right. These are the ways of the Lord. And the Bible says this in this verse, that, that the wise man, the discerning man or woman, I'm using man as, as uh, a shorthand for mankind, the, the wise person seeks to understand and know them. Look, look again, your eyes in the verse. You might say, well, it's just one verse, Jeremy. You, you've been covering like 47 chapters a week for the past three weeks. And, you know, this week we got one verse. Yeah, sorry. The wise man seeks to understand and know them. Look in verse 9. Whoever is wise, let him understand Whoever is discerning, let him know. There's the idea of seeking and pursuing in order to know and to understand. These first two lines of verse 9, I, th I think both of these phrases are given to help us understand how one person pursues the Lord. You, you pursue the Lord by, by seeking to know his ways and understand his ways. So let me ask you this. Do you seek to know the ways of God? I mean, do you really seek to know the ways of God? There's a hard truth that many of us, and I'm saying us because I'm included in the us, there's a hard truth that many of us have to face right now. Many of us do not seek diligently to know the ways of God. Many people spend more time seeking to know the ways of their golf swing or the latest movies or the latest rifles and ammunition and hunting strategies. I'm not, I'm, I'm not saying that I would even know someone who would do that, but or people spend more time seeking to know how to make their investments grow than they do seeking to know the ways of the Lord. They, they spend more time, some of you spend more time seeking to know how to make the grass in your lawn grow than you do seeking the ways of the Lord so that you and your family will grow. You spend more time seeking the latest health trend or scrolling mindlessly through social media than you do seeking to know the ways of the Lord. You might say, man, Jeremy, that's convicting. Yeah, yep, it is. Friend, listen, you must, you must seek to know the ways of the Lord. That takes intentionality. You don't passively accidentally stumble in the knowing the ways of the Lord. Do you know why I can't speak Spanish fluently? Yeah, I don't know Spanish. I don't understand Spanish. I don't spend any time trying to know or understand Spanish. I, I don't know Spanish. I do other things with my time, but I don't understand and know Spanish. Friends, if you're going to know and understand the ways of the Lord, it is going to take the same kind of intentionality that it would take for you to learn another language or to grow healthy grass in your lawn or to make your, back, your, your, your golf swing perfect. It's not going to happen by merely saying that we want to know the ways of the Lord. How, how can you know the ways of the Lord? Well, you can read them. Everyone has a Bible or two or three. 10 or 30 or an almost infinite number on our 
smart devices. You can read the ways of the Lord. You can study the ways of the Lord. You can memorize the ways of the Lord. You can Sunday school together the ways of the Lord. You can podcast the ways of the Lord. You can church together the ways of the Lord. You can sing the ways of the Lord and write down the ways of the Lord and discuss with friends the ways of the Lord and read them in good Christian biography. And you can talk to older Christians about the ways of the Lord and talk to younger Christians about the ways of the Lord. You, you learn to know and understand the ways of the Lord the way you learn to know and understand anything in your human experience. So do you seek to know and understand the ways of the Lord? Are are you wise and discerning? Now, very few of us would answer that question overtly. If I said, are you wise, there would be very few people in the room that would say, yes. Yep, I'm wise, right? Because then immediately you're not humble and you've got your your own issues to deal with there. But as you answer this question kind of just personally and privately, I want to remind you that you're not not wise and discerning simply because you're over 55 years of age. there's, there's There's no description of once you're a certain age, you become wise. I've met some very wise people over the age of 55, but I've met some very wise people under the age of 55. I've met a lot of foolish people over the age of 55. You're not wise because of your age. You're not wise because you've gone to church for a long time. You're not wise because you've made a lot of money. You're not wise because you have a lot of education. You're not wise because you make important decisions. And you're not wise simply because a lot of people come to you for counsel. Those aren't the things that make you wise. What makes you wise is knowing and understanding the ways of God. You are wise if you know and understand the ways of the Lord. Now, here's one of the ways that you can kind of test and gauge whether or not you know and understand the ways of the Lord. This is just a little this is a test, a little metric for you to know. When, when you face a problem, when you encounter a problem, do Bible verses come out of your mouth? Okay, then, then, you're, then you, at least to some degree, know and understand the ways of the Lord. When you have a problem, does the answer come to you in the form of God's words? Not Dr. Spock's, he's not even a thing anymore. Not Oprah's, not who are, I, don't, I mean, I, I listen to Pod. Not Joe Rogan's or Jordan Peterson's or, right, the, the prophets of our day. That, that's not what makes us wise. Does God's word come into your mind when you're faced with a problem? When your kids are fighting, do Bible verses come to your mind where you think, be quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to wrath? Or do you just walk in like a she-bear robbed of her cubs, right? You're just throwing kids around and dishes around and like, right? You're bigger and louder and stronger, and so you're going to shut this down. When you're tempted with lust, does, the, does God's word come to your mind? I will set no wicked thing before my eyes. I can do all things through Christ. When, when, you're, when you have trouble with a coworker, do you stop and remember, wait a second, only by pride comes conflict. When you're tempted to cheat on your taxes, do you remember, wait a second, render to Caesar. What is Caesar's? When you willingly and intentionally go over the speed limit regularly, do you stop and think, wait a second, God says to obey those who have the rule over me. When you're discouraged, does God... Does God's word come to your mind and you think, what can separate me from the love of God in Christ Jesus? When you're fearful, do you remember, the Lord is my helper, who will I fear? When you're worried, do you remember to cast your cares upon the Lord because he cares for you? Listen, wisdom is not 
found in the strong and mighty people in this room. Wisdom is found in the people in this room who when they encounter a problem, God's word comes into your mind. That is knowing and understanding the ways of the Lord. And here is the glorious thing about that truth. Everyone in the room can have it. Everyone can have it. Regardless of your age or your education or your income, everyone in this room can have the wisdom God wants you to have. I think, I think I've, been, I've been thinking about this a lot lately, even just for me. And there are people that I interact with, and I think, man, that guy's wise. And, and I've been thinking about that lately, and, I, and I've realized, well, the reason I think he's wise is because he does, like, God's word is what comes out of him when he's working through an issue, when he's working through a situation. Bible verses are coming out of his mouth. And, and it was encouraging to me to remember, well, by God's grace, I can do that too. Like, I, I know a lot of Bible verses. Wisdom isn't just something that you just kind of get as God just sprinkles wisdom dust on you. Wisdom is knowing and understanding the ways of the Lord. The wise walk in the ways of the Lord, and the ways of the Lord are what makes that man, that discerning man or woman, wise. A truly wise person knows the ways, the words of the Lord. They might not have a high IQ. They might not have gone to school. They might not have a lot of money. They may not read a lot of books. They may not be able to read at all. And they can be wise. Friends, you can be wise if you know and understand the ways of the Lord. And it'll take time and energy, but you, you can know the ways of the Lord. Remember back to the opening illustration that I used, the traveling illustration. If I, if I travel to Greenville, the, the, that first scenario was going but not, not knowing where to go. That, that's foolish. That's a foolish thing to do. What is wise is to, is to know where it is that you're to be going. And, and God's word informs us so that we know what is wise and we know what is right. But that's not the only thing that this wise man is doing in this verse. He's not simply knowing and understanding, right? And you remember in the book of James, it says it's not good enough to just look and understand and behold. You need, to, you need to go away and obey and do. That's what a wise man does. And it's actually laid out for us here in this verse. Look at the, uh, the second half of the verse. The ways of the Lord are right, and the upright walk in them. They know and they understand, and they Walk in them, right? The foolish man says, I know how to get to Greenville. I know the best way to get there, but I'm going to go on roller skates via Portland. And we all go, that's foolish. That's stupid. Don't do that. As as Christians, we, we know a great deal. Many of you know a great deal about the ways of God through the word of God. And yet, you live your life as foolishly as me going to Greenville on roller skates via Portland. It, you know what God's word says, and yet you refuse to walk in the ways of the Lord. I hear people say things like this, well, I know I should stop, or I know I really need to do such and such, but friends, the Bible says to him who knows to do good and doesn't do it, that's sin to him. Friend, if you you know and understand the ways of the Lord and you don't walk in them, I'm going to use the word the Bible uses to describe you. In the book of Proverbs and uh, and other places in God's word, the word that's used to describe you is a fool. Now, if I was having a private conversation with you and I called you a fool, you might punch me in the nose. But 
it doesn't change the fact that many of us often behave foolishly. We, we see that God's word says, thou shalt not, and we walk away from it and we shout. We do it. We, we disobey the ways of God. And your list of excuses does not rescue you from your foolish sinfulness. You view pornography, you gossip, you overeat, you watch wicked things on Netflix, you listen to music that celebrates the things Jesus died to save you from. And your excuses do not excuse you. God wants us to know and understand his ways and then to walk in them. Do you obey God's ways? Do you, do you live in relationship with God? This is, this is different than being a conservative or moral or listening to Christian radio. I mean, do you, do you really know and walk with God? Motivated by love, you must walk in God's ways and you'll be blessed. John 14, 15, if you love me, keep my commandments. That's Jesus saying, listen, if you really love me, you will walk in my ways. You, you need, my brothers and sisters, this morning, you need to hear directly from God. You need to hear God this morning clearly calling you to this. You must obey my word. That's not Jeremy. That's God and his word. You must obey God's word. The wise, the righteous, the upright man here at the end of this verse, the upright man walks in them. Some people walk in the ways of God and other people stumble in the ways of God. The transgressor, they stumble. The transgressors stumble in them. They, they stumble in the keeping of God's commands. The, the person who doesn't know God as their Savior, the unwise, the undiscerning, those who don't come to him. Have, have you ever interacted with, with someone? And it just, it just seems like their whole life, they're just like stumbling through life constantly. They're just stumbling through life, right? It's just like bang, bang. They're, they're driving their car down the road of life, and instead of staying in the right lane, they crash off the guardrail on the right side, only to swerve all the way across the road to crash into the left-hand guardrail and back, right? They're playing some kind of ping pong with their car down the road. Like, it's just, they're stumbling in the way. And there are those who don't know Christ who will stumble ultimately if they don't come to God through Christ. Proverbs 10, 29, the way of the Lord is a stronghold to the blameless, but destruction to evildoers. The person, the person who is wise and has relationship with God will know and understand and walk in them, but the person who is unwise and undiscerning and is not rightly related to God will stumble in this same path. So we're to, we're, to, we're to know the ways of God and we're to walk in the ways of God and the person, the person who knows the ways of God and walks in the ways of God will do one thing in particular and that brings us to point number three. That person will trust the work of the Lord. One more time, don't forget that this proverb concludes the book of Hosea. It's not just floating out there in a vacuum for us. In Hosea, we see that the primary lesson to be learned and remembered is that Yahweh is a God of unconditional, always and forever love for his people. That's the primary lesson in the book of Hosea. The primary lesson is not that you're a great sinner. That's a lesson in there, but that's not primary. There's a lesson in there about the judgment against sin, but that's not primary. The primary lesson is that there is someone named Hosea who moves towards someone who does not deserve his love. 
and brings her back into relationship with himself. And the chapter that ends that story specifically, chapter 3, ends with Hosea bringing Gomer back into his home. And we're left without knowing Gomer's ultimate or final response. We actually, we actually don't, we don't see what Gomer did. I'm really curious to know how this relationship ended. I have a feeling I'm going to get to find out one day in heaven. But God in his wisdom leaves this story open-ended in his wisdom for us. We don't, we don't know. We don't know. Was Gomer a wise woman who, who sought to understand and know the ways of the Lord and walk in them? Or did she come back into Hosea's family one more time only to leave again? That, that we don't know. We do know that this proverb is concluding this story for us on purpose. The ultimate lesson that the wise that we read about here in verse 9. The ultimate lesson that the wise will learn from the book of Hosea is not about their sin or a need for behavior modification. The ultimate lesson is regarding this mind-blowing, almost unbelievable love of God for his people. That's what Hosea, or excuse me, what Gomer and Israel and you and I are to know and understand and walk in. We are to know and understand the steadfast love of God and we are to walk in the steadfast love of God. What we do know, was, back up, sorry, I got ahead of myself in a, a few moments ago in my notes because I was excited about talking about Hosea. Let me find where I'm supposed to be here. We get to the end of the book and we don't know if Gomer responds well. We don't know if she's a wise woman or not. We don't know if she walks in wisdom or stumbles in foolishness. But clearly that's not the main point. We aren't supposed to know that or we would have been told that. What we do know is that Hosea is faithful. Hosea is loving. Hosea is providing even when Gomer doesn't know that he's providing for her. Hosea is seeking even when Hose- uh, Gomer doesn't want to be sought. Hosea is in her, uh, wants relationship uh, with her. Hosea is willing to move into extremely hard and difficult circumstances created by Gomer in order to save Gomer from the consequences she deserves. See, this book, this book highlights the steadfast love of Hosea, which points us ahead to the steadfast love of Jesus Christ. All along I've said this book is the gospel of Hosea, the good news of Jesus, right? Hosea, we know that even the name Hosea ultimately becomes the same name that Jesus himself carries. Hosea turns to Joshua, turns to Jesus. The name itself is pointing us ahead to the steadfast love, not primarily of Hosea. He's dead and gone. He was a sinful man like you and I are. But to the steadfast love of Jesus Christ. Points us ahead to the steadfast love of Jesus. There is really only one upright one. Look at the end of verse 9. The upright walk in the ways of God. There's only one who did that perfectly. There's only one upright one. There's only one righteous one in the world, and that is Jesus Christ. He walked in the way of the Lord, and he did it because you didn't. Hosea moved toward Gomer because Gomer was not going to move toward Hosea. Christ moved toward us because we were not moving toward Christ. Jesus moved into extremely hard and difficult circumstances created by us in order to save us from the consequences we deserve. The primary will of God for you is to glorify him by trusting in him as your savior and then knowing and understanding his love for you and walking in it. So if you've never done that, that means you need to turn from your sin, turn from your Gomer-like ways and put your faith in Jesus Christ. And if you have done that, but you have wandered away, you've, you've, 
You've left aside the knowing and understanding of God's ways. Or maybe you know and understand a lot of God's ways, but you've chosen to ignore them and and not walk in them. Know this, that you can walk, you can know and understand and walk in the ways of God empowered by God. You, You can know and understand and walk in the ways of the Lord. One Author says this, Hosea's final message to us is this. So imagine, imagine Hosea saying these words. How do you read the words of this book? Do they enlighten you or confound you? Are they life to you or death to you? Your response describes not so much the state of my book, but the state of your soul. We've read through and talked about this story of Hosea and Gomer week after week after week after week. We have seen it point us clearly to the love of God in Jesus Christ. We have seen the steadfast love of God in the gospel of Jesus Christ. We conclude our time together with this. Whoever is wise, let him understand these things. Whoever is discerning, let him know them. For the ways of the Lord that we've just read about in these last 14 chapters, the ways of the Lord, they're right. And the upright walk in them, but transgressors stumble in them. Let's pray together now. Before I pray, let me just talk to you for just a moment. If you'd bow your head and close your eyes, please. I'm going to do something. um, I'm calling an audible here for a second. JT, could you come? And then Taylor, could you come back up and lead us in that prayer again? Is she here? Oh, that's okay. Never mind. Let's not do that. You're you're mom, mothering, okay? So you stay put. Um, I should have caught that ahead of time. Um, but I do want us to think through the, the the prayer that Taylor led us in was such a helpful. Do you have the words to that by any chance up here? Can we put those on the screen? Can we put those prayer prompts on the screen? This is a great way for us to conclude. I'll ask JT just to play quietly. But I want you to do business with the Lord. I'm not going to read the prayer. I'm not going to talk every 20, 30 seconds, just flip to the next screen. And I want you to pray. These prayer prompts are wonderful, uh, is a wonderful way for us to respond to the truths that we've just read regarding wisdom, knowing wisdom, choosing to obey God, and in the power of the Spirit doing so, with the power of God's self, motivated by the love of God that's ours in Christ Jesus. So I'm going to give you three, two or three minutes. And Jack, if you could just scroll through those every 20 or 30 seconds, that would be helpful. And brothers and sisters, feel free to keep your eyes open and look up. Look at the words on the screen here. And you just take a few moments to do business with God there in your seat. Father, I pray that we would be people who 
know and understand the ways of the Lord because they're right. I pray that we would be people who walk in them. I pray that you would help us to be people who help others walk in them. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand. If you have prayer requests that you'd like to share with a pastor, if you have any counsel that you'd like to receive, there'll be pastors down here in the front and in the lobbies now and after the service, and we'd be happy to visit with you and pray with you about anything that you'd like to visit with. We see the ways of the Lord. We see the steadfast love of Jesus Christ modeled for us by Hosea most clearly in one moment in time, at the cross. The cross of Jesus Christ is where we see most clearly his steadfast love for us. And so let's conclude our time together this morning singing about the cross of Christ together.